Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. <coughs> Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who clean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts, the judge seeks a bride, and the great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will heal me. Appreciate it, Brother Daniel. They're reading that. He read that from the New King James Version. I think it's a little bit clearer, maybe, than the King James in that particular passage today. I want to talk this morning about help for the discouraged. You know, our text was written about the year 700 BC, before Christ, seven years before Christ, by the prophet Micah, who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. Micah was discouraged by the sin that he saw around him. God, he knew, was about to take the northern kingdom of Samaria into Syrian captivity in the year 721 B.C. He was seeing that. And he knew also the southern kingdom was sliding downhill. The old kingdom of David and, and uh, Hezekiah. And they would also go into captivity in 586 B.C. But notice Micah's discouragement here in this passage. The red, he felt like a vine with no grapes on it. Barren. Verse 1. Verse 2, he says, The good men have perished, how the earth, the faithful men. In verse 3, that they do, may do evil with both hands earnestly. Verse 4, the best of them is a briar or a thorn bush. Number 5, don't trust in a friend. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty, uh, we might say, discouraged, if not in despair, what Micah said there. And, you know, it's easy to, fall into the trap of discouragement. When we constantly look at the way things might have been, if I just had taken this job, or if I'd just done this or done that, instead of looking forward to what will be, sometimes we left, let life's difficulties get us down. And it's because we do not trust in God. That's why Mike at the end said in verse 7, Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait on God for my salvation. My God will hear me. There are many examples in the Bible of God's servants being discouraged and wanting to give up. In all cases, what does God do? God rebukes them. And He proceeds then to encourage them because God is not discouraged. Thank God He is not discouraged. If I was God, I'm not. 
If I was God, I would have been discouraged a long time ago. But he's not. In Job chapter 38, for example, Job was discouraged and said, Oh, woe is me, all these things happened to me. And uh, God spoke to him and said, Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answerest thou me. <laughs> Pretty strong language. Many Christians today experience discouragement. I think one of the, the most discouraging things as a preacher, two things actually, number one is when you see other preachers who are no longer preaching. And we were talking a little bit about this this morning after services. That's discouraging. But also when you see uh, a congregation, people will kind of drop out and just stop attending. We've had some do that here. That's discouraging. But you know, God has not left us alone in this world. He has given us relief. He has given us a way out of discouragement. I wanted to examine that today, different ways that God has given us so we can overcome discouragement. One is we can be helped by self-examination. We need to ask ourselves when we're discouraged, what is the root cause of my discouragement? Self-examination, brethren, is thoroughly biblical. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul told the Corinthian brethren, he says, examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves? That Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. He says, you're not just a sorry sinner out here, a non-Christian. You are Christians. You have the right to examine yourselves, to see if Christ is still there. And the best way to do that, to examine oneself, is not just to have a pity party. Not to say it, compare yourselves with somebody else. But the best way to examine yourself is to use God's Word to probe into your soul. And the Bible is perfect for this. The Bible is God's scalpel. In the book of Psalms 19, verse 12, there David says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick, powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword, piercing even dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Nothing else can do that. Nothing else can do that like God's word can, to examine our lives. Now one cause of a lot of discouragement is sin. Is sin. Job 13, verse 23. Job examined his life. He says, How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Of course, that was, sin was not the cause of, of Job's predicament. Satan was. But he wondered, was there sin there? Because he knew sin can cause one to be discouraged. It can cause one's love to turn cold if you're a Christian. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus spoke to the Ephesian church, the church of Ephesus. And he says, Nevertheless, I have something somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Left your first love. Sin can cause feelings of despair. Genesis 4, verse 13. Very sad statement. When uh, Cain, of course, has slayed his brother Abel, God brought this to his attention. He knew it already. And sends him out in exile. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Sin can cause feelings of shame and inadequacy. James 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and do it not, to him it is sin. As Christians, we read that verse and we think, I knew what to do and I didn't do it. And that's sin. And brethren, let us never forget that Satan can also cause discouragement. Satan is alive and well. Over the book of 1 Kings, we're going to refer to this a couple of times. 1 Kings chapter 19. 
here we see the, uh, the prophet of God, Elijah. He just had a, uh, what's the old phrase, a, a uh, moment on Mount Carmel, which he confronted the prophets of Baal. And Ahab was there. He defeated them, and God defeated them, lit Elijah's sacrifice miraculously. But then notice in verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, and with all how he'd slain all the prophets with the sword. They'd slain, I think it was 400 prophets of Baal there at Mount Carmel. And Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And this lady could have done it too. And it says, Elijah, when he saw that, he rose and he went for his life. He ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree and he requested that him, for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. That's discouragement. And now, who was that caused by? It was caused by Satan working through Jezebel. We need to ask ourselves, in the light of God's Word, am I doing God's will in my life? Not if you're just discouraged. We need to ask ourselves that. Jeremiah the prophet did in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. Jeremiah said, Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Examine our lives in the light of God's Word, not according to what someone else says, not according to what someone else, some other example or, or whatever, some imagined thing, but according to God's Word. But you know, we can also be helped by prayer. As Brother Danny pointed out to me, he's pointed out to me on occasion, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, right where so, is a good verse. Where Paul says, and nothing be anxious or frustrated or despair. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passeth understanding, all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. That is a wonderful verse, passage, verses. We can be helped by prayer. And you know, that's a le lesson a lot of discouraged Christians have forgotten. They forget the value of prayer. Hebrews 4, verse 16. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us therefore draw near with boldness into the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy, that we may find help, grace rather, to help us in time of need. Notice that. Draw with boldness. Throne of grace. It's our privilege, our right as Christians to do that. You know, God has always, or rather God's servants throughout the Old and New Testament have always prayed when they were discouraged. When Jacob prayed for deliverance, when he knew, just knew that his brother Esau was going to kill him because of what he had done to Esau. He had, uh, you know, God took away his birthright. Now, Esau was to blame there too, obviously, but in Genesis chapter 32, but he was afraid Esau was going to kill him. When Esau found out that, that he, had, he and uh, uh, I believe it was Rebecca had arranged all this this uh, set up all this thing that made him look uh, that J Isaac, his father, thought he was blessing Esau and actually he was blessing Jacob. And Esau found out about it. He was angry. And Jacob ran for his life. He prayed that God would help him. Joshua went up into the land of Israel. Second battle after Jericho. First battle after Jericho. Second battle of conquest of the promised land. They went up against the inhabitants of Ai. They were defeated. They ran away from them. And Jake and Joshua in Joshua chapter 7, he and his 
And the elders of Israel rip their garments and they fall down in the tabernacle to the ground. And they pray to God. David prayed when he was discouraged. 1 Samuel chapter 30, when David, before he became king, was still a, a uh, leader of men, had a, a band that he had together fighting Israel's enemies. They were all fighting Israel's enemies and said they came back and another enemy of, of David had come and taken all he and his wives and children and everyone else's wives and children hostage. And it says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons, for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The prophet Elijah, we talked about Elijah, they didn't want to sit under the juniper tree and say, oh, woe is me, I need to be dead. Another, a few days later, when he was in a cave there, perhaps at Mount Sinai, some think, there God tapped him on the shoulder and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, and I, even I, am left, and they seek my life to take it. Speaking of Jezebel and others. Read about the prophet Jeremiah who often was discouraged. Often discouraged and prayed to God. And lest we forget, what about Jesus? There he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. All had turned against him. His disciples, those who would soon leave him, would be betrayed by his friend Judas. And he says he went a little farther and fell on his face, praying, Oh, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. Now, there's a couple of sermons in that. And last but not least, how about Paul? Paul in his agony, his thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, physical ailment. And he prayed to God three times. It says, this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Here was a man who could heal others and raise the dead. And as we mentioned in class this morning, handled serpents and not uh, bitten by serpent, not killed. And yet he had this thorn in the flesh that he couldn't get rid of. We should always, when we pray to God, not just pray, oh God, I'll need help. We should do that. But also center our prayers on thankfulness. Psalm 68, verse 19, David said, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. So how can we overcome discouragement with prayer? We can also be helped by seeking encouragement from our encourager. Prophet Elijah was encouraged by the Word of God. There at that, as I told you a moment ago, where Elijah says, I've given up, I need to be dead. And the later says, well, uh, they're, they're seeking my life. What good am I? God said, 1 Kings 19, verse 18, Yet I have left 7,000 Israel, all the knees of what, which have not bowed unto, the, unto Baal, every mouth which hath not kissed him. They would go and kiss the idol. He says, don't be discouraged. But what do people do? And often brethren do this too. They get discouraged. And what do they do? They go to some devotional book and some motivational tape or some self-help pop psychology like Oprah Winfrey or somebody like that that may have little some interesting things there, but why not go to the Word of the One who made us? Colossians 2 verse 8. Paul says, Beware lest any man spoil you or take you captive through philosophy and vain deceit, after tradition of men, after the rhythm of the world, and not after Christ. Amen. Why go to all those things that are not the Word of God and they may offer something, but it's not the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 28, David wrote, My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. Many people who are discouraged today are insecure about the future. You know, many people in this country are worried about the future of this country. <laughs> Rightly so. 
Psalm 37, verse 25. David reminds us, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God had never forsaken David even though he was sometimes <coughs> in very difficult, desperate situations. Philippians 4, verse 19, Paul, when he was in prison, <coughs> Said, but my God shall apply, supply all my your needs according to riches in grace, riches of his grace and glory by Christ Jesus. Some folks are in despair because of the death of a loved one. A lot of times this time of year it's that way. They remember that loved one that used to face them across the table at the Christmas dinner. God has something for them too. Isaiah 66, verse 15. God says, as one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you. Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Other people among us Christians are often in despair, overwhelmed by suffering and illness. What does the Word of God say? Psalm 55, verse 22, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer or allow the righteous to be moved. Oh, we may be moved around a little bit, tossed to and fro, but we will never be moved. You know, that tree, that young sapling there in the wind goes back and forth. They're still there. And of course, Apostle Paul said, Corinthians chapter 12, when he prayed to God those three times, that thorn in the flesh might be removed from him. Said, and God spoke to him and said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul adds, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What a wonderful attitude. But we can also be helped in discouragement when we get busy. You know, it's easy when one is discouraged to throw up their hands like Elijah and others and just kind of want to quit. Want to quit. But this has never been God's will that His people quit. Again, we go back to Joshua. There they are, and they, they've lost this battle. You know, and God had promised them, oh, you're going to just roll over the Canaanites. It's all going to be a great, glorious victory. And there they had lost the second battle that they'd been involved with and ran like a bunch of scared quail. And there they are on the ground before the tabernacle. Joshua and the children of Israel. Joshua 7 verse 10, The Lord said to Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? <laughs> what are you doing here? Get up. And he told, he, he revealed Joshua what the problem was. There was sin in the camp, Achan. You can read about that and how to, how to take care of it. How about the David? When he committed adultery with Bathsheba, it had been pointed out to him that he had sinned. He repented of those sins. was forgiven. But then he and Bathsheba have a young baby. And it's sick to the point of almost death. And David goes to his palace, goes out and falls on the ground and prays and fasts to God for several days, not eating. And his servants are worried about him. The elders of Israel come to him and they say, what are you doing here? You know, Can we help you? And he says, no. But then in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 21, it says, but when the, the king heard all these things, he was very... That's not the one I want. Excuse me. Chapter 12, verse 21. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? And what... I, back up here. The child had died. David heard them talking about it while he was there on the ground. And he gets up. And he anoints himself cleans himself up, puts on new clothes, 
goes to the tabernacle there, worships God, comes back and eats a meal. And his servant said to him, What thing is it that thou hast done? Verse 21, Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst eat, rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore shall I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. That is a great verse of faith right there. David knew he had to do something. <clears throat> he knew he could not just wallow there in despair. How about Elijah? 1 Kings chapter 19 again. God's confronted Elijah and says, What are you doing here? And he says, and he says in verse 14 of 1 Kings 19, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now what did God say to him? The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. He didn't say, well, that's all right, Elijah, we understand. No, he says, you get up and you go do what I want you to do. You get to work. Brethren, that's the way it should be with a Christian too. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life <coughs> for my sake will find it. One cure for discouragement is activity in the kingdom of heaven. Doing something for the Lord. Romans 12, verse 11, in diligence not slothful, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Do something. But another way we can face discouragement is we can realize that we are helped when we know our purpose. You know, an individual with purpose, and I know everybody would agree with this, is a pretty pitiful thing to see. I sometimes see young people in school that are, have no purpose. They're just kind of flipping, flopping around. They have no purpose. I see adults like that too sometimes. I see Christians that way with no, no real purpose. They don't understand. James 1 verse 6 in the prayer, talking about prayer rather, James said, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed, flip, flopping around. No, doesn't understand, just flipping, flopping around. Matthew 8 verse 26, the Lord said, when they were out in the middle of the sea in uh, Sea of Galilee and this big waves came up in the storm and here he was asleep at the bottom of the boat. <laughs> and he got up and said, uh, he woke up and said, Master, Master, we're perishing here. But he woke up and he said, Why are you fearful? Oh, you have little faith. Then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea and there was great calm. Purposeless Christians, brethren, soon become unfaithful, backsliding Christians. It often happens that way. They do not understand. Matthew 16, verse 26. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? Brethren, we must realize that the Lord's purpose must be our purpose. What was his purpose? John 6, verse 38. For I came down to heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me. That was his purpose, to do God's will. And discouragement can be overwhelmed, overcome, when one understands and does their part in God's grand plan. And we are part of God's grand plan, whether we realize it or not. We are. We should realize it. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Paul wrote, according as God has chosen us, as the Christian, in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be <clears throat> holy and without blame before Him in love. God has chosen us for that purpose. Ephesians 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's our purpose. 
2 Peter 1, verse 10, Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to things you... Uh, to, read that again. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Brethren, we must have that purpose. I see so many Christians I've seen in my life who do not realize their purpose in life. And they, they wonder why they are discouraged and why they flip and flop around. Because they don't know who they are and who they serve. Is this discouragement in your life? If you are not a Christian, then you are not a follower of the great encourager. How does one become a Christian this morning? Well, here's the word. It's 10 verse 17. One believes that word. That Jesus is the Son of God. <coughs> John 8 verse 24. One repents of their sins. Acts 17 verse 30. One is then baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Confessing Jesus before that as the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 9 and 10. And one is baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Risen up from that watery grave, a new creature with purpose. Maybe you are a discouraged Christian this morning. Maybe you need to ask God's forgiveness where you sit. Or maybe if you brought reproach on the church, you need to ask Him. Come forward and ask your brethren's forgiveness. If this is your need today. Please come as we stand. Just as